Jordan the Belcourt's Education and Engagement Director, and welcome to Science on Screen. Overwhelmed that we that we sold out this special screen. This is our kickoff to um, our Science on Screen series, and um, wow, it's just great to see everybody here like this. And um, so this um, this screening of 2001: A Space Odyssey kicks off a month of films about about science, and um, this is because of a grant that we received from the Coolidge Corner Theater with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. So with this Science on Screen grant, um, the Belcourt Theater and 19 other art house cinemas in the country are connecting cinematic art with hard science in March. And so that includes for us five major events with distinguished guests like tonight. And we also have science themed films for our midnight movies and our Saturday kids shows. We have um, a special series for high school students during their intercession period, so there's really something for everyone. So I want to say a big thank you to the Coolidge Corner Theater and to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for giving us this opportunity. And I would also um, like to say thanks for their ongoing support to the Metro Arts Commission and the Tennessee Arts Commission who give us grants that support us every day. So thanks to them. Oh, and also, I want to say thank you to Nashville's Barnard Seifert, or Seifert Astronomical Society, who brought telescopes for the parking lot tonight. We got a little cloudy out there, so we didn't get a chance to see the moon and Jupiter. But if the sky clears at the end of the presentation tonight, stop by the parking lot and, and take a peek in the telescope. But, um, so we have two very, very special guests here tonight, both from Huntsville. And I really can't think of two people who are more appropriate to kick off science on screen. Um, our guest of honor, who I'm sure you know about, he'll join us after the film, is a space scientist, um, an author of several books on space flight. He has the distinction of being Stanley Kubrick's scientific advisor on 2001, A Space Odyssey. His name is Frederick Ordway. He's sitting in the back of the hall. Please help me welcome Frederick Ordway. are going to sit in the back and watch the film um, tonight. So, um, but before we get started, I want to introduce you to another very special guest. Um, she will lead tonight's discussion with Fred. She'll also lead the, lead the discussion on March 31st when we show the film For All Mankind. Um, she is an aerospace engineer in, I want to make sure I say it right, in materials and structures at the NASA Marshall Space Site Center in Huntsville. Um, she's also a great movie lover and a longtime patron of the Belcourt Theater. She got her PhD at Vanderbilt in 2012, and when she was here in her Vanderbilt days, she came to the Belcourt two or three times a week. Um, furthermore, she told me that her deciding to choose a, a, a career in aerospace was inspired largely by her love of movies. So I believe that she is the spirit of the Science on Screen series. So please help me welcome NASA Aerospace Engineer <laughs> Tracy Cater. Thank you, Allison. I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, as she mentioned, I got involved with this because of a really long, kind of rambling email I sent back in the fall. Um, talking about my involvement with Belcourt when I was a graduate student here and the ways in which film, and particularly films about space, had kind of influenced my career path. Um, so at NASA we talked kind of a lot about how to engage students in STEM, and so a lot of my friends, if you ask them, they all have a space movie. Everybody has one kind of singular film that made them want to pursue a career to work at NASA. Um, for me, um, that was Apollo 13. Um, when I came out when I was 11, and my parents took me to see it, and then when we went to see it every weekend, that it was in theaters for pretty much the entire summer. At some point, we were running out of relatives to take me <laughs> to the movies to see it. And there's a scene in that movie, I'm sure you're familiar with it, the square peg and a round hole scene that really made engineers look like heroes. And it made it look super glamorous. 
it's not necessarily that glamorous, but it was certainly one of the things that made me um, want to pursue that. Um, the other film, a few years later, that came out was October Sky, and that came out when I was in eighth grade, I think. Um, and so here was this guy, Homer Hickam, who grew up in a coal mining town that wasn't very different from the town I grew up in in Kentucky. So seeing um, someone who was similar to you, who did what you ultimately wanted to do, was a very powerful thing. And I remember seeing the card at the end of the film, the little epilogue, that said, you know, Homer Hickam got a master's degree from Virginia Tech and then went on to become an aerospace engineer at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. And if you had told me when I was 14 that someday I would have the exact same job title at the exact same place, I never, ever would have believed that. Um, So I wasn't around during Apollo, but obviously inspired by the stories of that. Um, and you know, the space shuttle was present through my childhood and most of my adulthood. I was in two space shuttles, including the last launch. Um, now that we don't have that capability, I feel like film is even more important to tell the stories of you know what was, what is, and ultimately with films like 2001, what can be someday in the future if we dream. So I'm really excited that Fred is here. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited that Allison let me be involved. Um, and I'm really, really excited to see this film on a big screen, which I've never done. So thank you all for coming. I can't believe this all out. <laughs> That's amazing. So thank you. Thank you, Tracy. It's my honor to introduce to you the technical advisor for 2001 A Space Odyssey, Fred Ordway. with Fred started and then we'll look at Fred's presentation and get some audience questions. Okay. So before we go into Fred's presentation, just kind of a starter question is the genesis of your relationship with Arthur C. Clarke, how you met him, and then how you ultimately became involved with Kubrick and became the scientific advisor for this film. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. We're glad, glad you're all here. Uh, I'm, I want to tell you how I got into this. I was an old friend of Arthur C. Clarke. We met in, in Paris. Is that on? Yes. Yeah, totally Is there yeah. uh, in 1950? I was the American delegate to the world's first international astronomical uh, conference, which held in Paris. The next conference, by the way, every year, goes on to the Green Toronto. Now, this coming in our order. And we saw the connection immediately. I had read his uh, the books, I wrote the scientific reputation. I was very active. He was the executive secretary of the British Planetary Society, and I've been active since a student member when I was only 13 years old of the American Rock Society. And so we know we knew about each other, we, and we connected instantly. And, uh, well, all those years we were friends. Well, I was working in the space world in the United States. I, was, uh, uh, I happened to be in, in uh, New York at an international meeting. In January of 1965, I had been working for the John C. Marshall Space Flight Center in Arsenal, Alabama, for Jeremy Von Brown, and working before that with Army Lewis and Mr. Latency, and before that with Earth's Rocket Engine Companies. So I had a long history that went way back uh, to you, and I collected all, all magazines and early science fiction books and so forth. So we were just brothers almost under the skin. And I was in New York attending a, a, a week long meeting. Society. Just hold my little closer. Hold closer. Okay. And uh, I, I was there, and somebody during that day in January 1965 said, Oh, by the way, Fred, I hear your old friend Arthur Clark is in town. And I didn't know, I knew that he was in New York, occasionally he was living in his first and so on, so, uh, uh, 
of Salon and then they changed the name in 1972 to Sri Lanka. And he'd been an expatriate for Britain for a long time. And when he went came to the States on various occasions, and I was seeing him in New York pretty regularly, but I didn't know he was in New York in that uh, uh, particular trip. I knew that he always stayed at the Chelsea Hotel on 23rd Street, so I called him up, he was there, and we set up a, a meeting a couple of days later to get caught up. And I was a horror guy, I was a member of the Harvard of New York, but I always stayed in America New York. And, uh, and then he told me about the film that he'd been in the movie, the 2001, it was called 2001 then. He was an author to write a, a novel, uh, uh, what they call it, A Journey Beyond the Stars. And he was to, uh, a bit of, it's sure in almost every word he wrote to think that that novel was going to be turned into a screenplay. So he was writing a novel whose ultimate objective would be a film. And then of course the novel would be later be published under his name. And I said, well, isn't that interesting? There's something you know about. I had just published a book that he'd been done, uh, Life on the Solar System. And I had a book coming out with a colleague of mine, Harry Lottie. Uh, who uh, did all the illustrations for my books uh, uh, on extraterrestrial intelligence. And we prepared us all. And I went to the galley stage. We had a lot of illustrations up in my room. So the office said, could I take a look at them? And he said, oh, this is fascinating. We're going on the same path. And we looked at all the watches. And uh, so I thought the time was gone. I had been in the body here in the engagement. I went upstairs to get my coat and said, good morning, Arthur. And there was a snowing out there. They came out in the front row and out there in the cab for me. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, one of the employees said to me, Excuse me, uh, do we have a, uh, a telephone call for you then? And I thought it was the host of office for me, but I had trouble getting out of there. It was going to snow. And uh, the voice said, My name is Stanley Cooper. And I said, well, how, Excuse me? <laughs> and what offer it does to call him uh, for the first all lost. And I said that we um, talk about what I've been doing. I'm working with the most advanced. I've also been a lot years. I've worked in, in the space program before that. And, uh, and so he, uh, uh, Cooper, got interested and said, uh, uh, he said Are you going to be in New York? I said, I'll be here for this week. He said, Can we meet? And so we set up a meeting with Arthur with Arthur and Clark uh, and Stanley Cooper. And, uh, he, and I mean, that was all that meeting was. He said, Would you become a, a, a scientific consultant? Uh, and I thought that was a good way to get in. I worked on meetings up there, fly back and forth from us all around with Lord working. So that's how it got started. So what I thought I'd do tonight is to give you a little walk through the studios. My job was to gather incredible amounts of information from companies, the academic institutes, and from course from NASA. In, in every aspect, or technical aspect of the film. That is the whole part where we started off going uh, from Earth to uh, 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 the space station, the space station uh, to uh, uh, the moon, especially for the trip to all technical parts. I know had no involved at all in the early, uh, early uh, dawn of man sequence. All of them got their meetings. Uh, we, we 
had an orchestra, we for example, uh, near the studios in London, uh, became our consultant for some of the vehicular in interiors. Uh, there were uh, the, uh, 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 the Orion and the Port also some of the areas one be. These were people in the aerospace industry that, that and they could build things for us under contract. And we got the support so that everything had to be leg legitimate with a projection forward of course for 35 years. And we had an unbelievable support. The interest with Russell Kubrick and Clark's name uh, and, and the companies just bent over backwards to, to help us. Uh, you probably saw it in the film that issue of Perry Match magazine. I had contacts with the Perry Match people. They did a special 2001 edition. This is a Alberti directory uh, coming into the space station from the core. There's Cooper and, uh, and uh, Maggie Landon is one of the, uh, 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 and of course all their clothes had to be designed. Every chair had to be designed. Everything. And you know, I got the two pictures of Cooper for myself. We always, by the way, in those days, everybody was we wore a coat tie. And the one, you wouldn't even go out your front door without a coat tie. And so you will see this, and people ask you, well, why were you guys all dressed up when I showed you? We weren't dressed up, that's how we dressed in the 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so here's Cooper, uh, we were up at the space station at this particular moment, and he's talking about a scene. And I said, okay, this is what I'd like to happen here, you know. And then, you got a friend? <laughs> so I will make that combination of pictures. Uh, you saw this in the film. Uh, this is the, you know, uh, uh, it was Carol, she was a, a, a stewardess, came taking the food, um, and she, she is walking on a treadmill. So you can see what the top is, the top, the five the, the squares up, that's top. And the next thing you know, she's all walking upside down. Well, she was on a treadmill, and the camera was at the stationary. So it looked like she was walking in the zero degree, and it looked like one of the little Velcro that attacked those shoes. That you saw this briefly. This is one of the humorous things that Cooper permitted to be done. In fact, he thought about it. Let's do something humorous. And so well, we have the, the guy looking at going to the toilet and reading all of that. You know, that was a good, good humor. Uh, Honeywell, for example, were all contracts. They could build up all the instrumentation. And this is the thing you. If you looked with that psychomagnetic anomaly where you saw the big black slab on the moon. It was surrounded by instruments. And this is just one of them. And you think, God, those could have been anything. But no, we, they, Cooper got money. He didn't know which one he's going to put his camera on. So everything had to make sense. And that was a legitimate scientific explanation behind it. Uh, and Honeywell handled all those instruments for us. Uh, this is the design of the Discovery spaceship, the various parts, the command area, the pod bay where our little uh, uh, extra vehicle. Uh, two-man craft were, the home, the how, 9,000 Logic Center, and the centrifuge. And this, the centrifuge, of course, was the major set. Very expensive, uh, cost about uh, 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 250,000 uh, British pounds, uh, and it was uh, 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 about uh, 38 to 40 uh, uh, tons, very, very heavy, and uh, uh, that was roughly the same diameter as the tonnage. And so all of these modules had to be made. We had the blockers, we had the pressure rooms, we had the geophysical display, I'll talk about that in the middle, the telescope display. Those are all uh, modules. Uh, I got through a doctor, for example, at the Royal uh, 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 Astronomical Observatory, the Royal Brennan's Observatory in England, as our consultant. And uh, he developed the module for us so that everything there was, was logical and, and real. Not, not just a couple of uh, colored buttons and so forth, because the Kubrick said, I might put my camera right down there. So he was very insistent, so a lot of effort went into it, uh, which is my job. And this is the other, other rim. We have the pressure room, we have the toilet, the hand measure, the ladder, the hibernation. I'll tell you a little bit about the hibernation. Uh, the how you can see up there, the last and so forth. And the, 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 here they are, with Cooper getting instructions to two astronauts. Hibernation was something that fascinated me. The question was, first of all, what do I know about hibernation? Nothing. So I started doing research to find out who did. And I found out three people in the world, one in California, 
California, one locally in New York, which is very handy, and another uh, people we know with in London. The person in New York is a man named Orman Mitchell, the at the New York uh, uh, University uh, Medical Center. And he invited me over to his offices on this. He became interested in it. He said he would be uh, uh, more, than, more than interested in helping us. So I told him we had three astronauts uh, in hibernation uh, for this long uh, voyage to, uh, to Jupiter. And I said, and then he said, well, come over here. So he opened this huge refrigerator was full of little animals in hibernation. He could take animals all season and put them in the hibernation. He could also take animals that were very closely genetically related to hibernators, but nature had not put them into hibernation. Maybe it would take 100,000 years they would be that way. But he could hibernate them for short periods of time. And so I asked him, well, you think it's possible and he said, he said, not even laughingly, the same, well, if NASA gave me a million bucks or more, I might, might be able to do it over a period of years. And uh, but, but what he did do is to tell us, well, oh, you saw that when they, when they, when they killed the astronauts, and now kill the astronauts, all of the uh, uh, modules so, uh, and lines across the screen just go straight. So, and all of those are uh, the things that Dr. Uh, Mitchell gave to me. Uh, so those what would, would be monitoring all the signals, the winds, the signals, the heart rate, and everything else would be, um, so we to be absolutely accurate. And so that scene was uh, very le uh, legitimately accurate, and Cooper, this took his cameras right smack in the middle of that when Hal uh, uh, killed the uh, three uh, sleeping astronauts. Uh, there's the verification and the checkout line, there's everybody, my like, associate there. Uh, through the, uh, the three pods, see, there were three, I don't have to get names for them, Abby, uh, Betty, and Clary, the A.C., they were the most names I used to film with. Those were all, and, and those were they, uh, they, uh, all the interiors were done, every instrumentation in there was done by Walker Sibley Dynamics. And I'll tell you a little story. I have a small car, I lived in order with my family, and well, any time I went anywhere with it, uh, I had to fly, or go to Edinburgh or something, or take a train. I'm going to be a lot of time in Birmingham and uh, in, in Manchester. But when I did local stuff, I was prohibited from driving in my own car. Cooper insisted that we take the company big, Rolls or, 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 or Daniel Saloon, the big cars. And of course, I, I, a lot of my friends at these British companies that I knew said, Fred, what kind of job have you got? <laughs> uh, and that was just what he did. And they, the money didn't seem to be any, any, any impediment uh, that I could detect. I'm sure it was, if that wasn't in the financial area. But he, he spent money. Uh, and these are our these are our men, and those are the little gauges right over there. You can see that I'm sending out three astronauts. Um, and so that was one of the more fascinating things that I dealt with. Uh, I, I got I had friends at the U.S. Embassy. Uh, the the uh, Walter Bartoko, they became a key executive in the uh, National Science Foundation, uh, Fred Walter in the middle, the, the Jim McCamus was the air attaché, and Bert Edelson, who was an able attaché. Uh, and he later became head of the concept. And they were people of my conduits, and they would help generously, they could help get contacts and people that I needed, or specialists that I needed, uh, either in London, because they were in London, or, 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 or uh, through the United States. We had the uh, uh, the Soviets, here we are, and we were in a Cold War, but they were very generous. I needed their uh, Luna 9 of, of photography. They're, they were ahead of us at that moment of, of putting probes on the moon. Our rangers would we, 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 uh, just crash at that time. So we went back and forth. We were ahead of the Russians, they were ahead of us back and forth. And they were the only ones that had a probe on the surface of the moon. And we wanted to know exactly what that surface looked like because of those. When you saw that lunar muscle flying across the lunar surface, you want to make sure that it was as accurate as possible. And so they very generously uh, supplied the photographs from the, from the lunar night. And I know that we worked with the Russians just, you know, just like they were the big bodies. That we, they, that is, we co signed us, we worked together. Anyway, they were more than, more than generous. Uh, uh, that's actually good. 
Professor Cook is one of the top, world's top artificial intelligence guy. He worked back in the last week block during World War II uh, interpreting the German and Negro and other codes. And he was a Bartford professor, uh, a very close friends. And uh, he came in when any time we needed, and I would interview him. But well, his specialty was to take all the dialogue that, uh, that, that Clark was writing, that Kubrick was editing, of a dialogue back and forth between a computer and, uh, the, and the human. And he modified that, made all suggestions to make it make perhaps more realistic than it might have been without his aid. Uh, this is a, a, the main computer uh, area, how uh, where the Astros spent a great deal of their time. Uh, uh, this is uh, John Frassard, who was uh, from people over in Paris. I needed a top geophysical man, and Somerset was, was one of the big companies that support all the oil, the oil businesses in, in, in perforating uh, and, uh, and deep uh, perf uh, perforations of, in subsurface and doing sidewall samples and doing radiological survey, surveys of the, of the sediments and so forth. And, and so they were, became our geophysical uh, uh, consultants. Uh, and he came over with his wife. There all kinds of this. People want to bring their families in and the kids and that. There's a friend of this, I believe, at the Chabagnac, who has to be a direct descendant of the Marquis de Lafayette, who's been delightful to, uh, to uh, make her. And she was just a, a 2001 nut and came back to love on a number of occasions. And this was the result of the, 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 the Chassage you know, design and his company design at Slumbershade with the headquarters in Paris. Uh, the, 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 the Les Shepard and Ken Gatlin. Les Shepard is one of the top propulsion. Uh, experts in England and knew the propulsion and helped us a lot of the modification of some of our designs and so forth. And very close friends, uh, a member of the British Interplanetary Society, a white uh, author, and as is Ken Gatlin, uh, 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 his wife, uh, Dr. Shepard's wife and, and son. And uh, over here, the left is Richard Leakey, uh, this is son of the famous Lewis and, uh, uh, and Mary Leakey. Also an anthropologist, a graduate from Cambridge University, and he, he said, he still, oh, he always told his dad, he said, remember, Dad, I'm not British, I'm Kenyan. He was born in Kenya uh, and uh, brought up there because his parents were living there and doing all their work in Africa, and he, and he felt, and he's the head of the anthropological museum there now. But he always pointed out he was a Kenyan citizenship, and he was born there and lived, basically lived there all his life. And the first of the middle, the middle is Ernest Bellock, who was our key guy from IBM. And he came over from New York. I could call the phone in London and say, we got some problems. And he'd be over there within a day or two. But that's the sport that IBM did. So we really uh, appreciated uh, that. Okay, this is the last picture of our studio stroll. And on the left is a guy named Fred Ordway in tennis clothes. <laughs> what? Well, what happened? Dr. Ordway's the light is off to George Miller, who was the deputy of the administrator of NASA in charge of manned space flight. Right at the top of NASA. The guy next to me is Dean Slayton, head of the astronaut office, and a, a many times astronaut. And Arthur Clark. And uh, it's Andy Cooper again, uh, 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 back there is, uh, is Ali Grano, an associate of, of Dr. Miller from, from Houston, and uh, from headquarters at Houston. And the reason this picture was taken is that Dr. Miller asked Andy Cooper, could he stay another day? If I had briefed him, he could bring tours of the studios and of my offices, and he called, by the way, my office, he said, you got so many technical reports, and NASA reports, and other reports, that I'm going to call your office NASA East. <laughs> and a uh, delightful man. Uh, but he asked Cooper if he could stay another day and stroll around the studios when they were not filming. On a normal day, there'd be trucks going up and down, and cars going up and down, and, and he wanted to look at all the models they were doing in, in, in great detail without the busyness of, of a full filming day, for example, it was a Sunday. So Cooper called me and said, to Frederick, could you mind coming out in the studios? And I said, I'll be glad to. I got a tennis game, and I'll cancel right away. And Cooper said, what time is your tennis game? I said, well, it's going to have to be out in your area. About 8 o'clock or early in the morning again. And he said, play your tennis and come in your tennis clothes. I'll watch you with me. Are you sure? Yeah, I'll come in your tennis clothes. 
or a rabbit my final venture. A one story about that, a British author, a woman author, called me and said she's doing a, a, a book on Cooper. And she they, she discovered in the, in the files over there this picture. They, 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 cameras followed me everywhere because I had so many important people with me. And uh, she said, well, what are you doing in tennis club? And I explained. And she said, that's what we authors like, a story like that. Can I use the picture? And I said, well, you certainly can use the picture. And uh, so that ends my little uh, uh, studio stroll. I see the real thing. Uh, but it took two years out of my life. And uh, uh, I know we're going to a minute of it. Well, we have our space. small propulsion systems that are over there. Uh, uh, very low thrust, but they, they were only supposed to take you out, you know, to the, you know, the fairly decent uh, uh, distance from the, from the main spaceship. They were also designed perhaps to land on a small asteroid or a small block of what to do studies on a geophysical stuff. Studies of it. But they move a rocket power, uh, but they were basically just two men pods uh, to make repairs on the outside of the ship and do a limited reconnaissance and uh, perhaps a limited ge 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 geological work on a, on a small body or a small moon, something like that. The, the, the colleague of mine, uh, I've done some wonderful writing work uh, uh, with me, and I said, no, look, you, if you're going to say about things that I did, you say them, I don't want to say them myself. And so my collection, uh, I bought a lot of material back from 2001 with Google's permission. And I, I, I donated this to this U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville. And he said, and he was working with, and it still works with the Lockheed Martin people down in Orlando. So he came up, and they, they did a lot of restoration, uh, of, the, of, of the material that I had, of all these drawings, of all of this book, and, uh, and I have quite a bit of my own text in there, but he was a prime author, and he selected the pictures, he got, he got put a lot of pictures of me in there, which I would probably myself would be embarrassed if that way that he did, and, uh, and that book has been, I think, a very, very valuable uh, storehouse, and that material I bought a set of all our drawings we had. You can't imagine the number of, of, of drawings that we've really produced, you know, with the art department based on our uh, designs of people, of the, of the artists, the concepts, and uh, the design concepts which had to go through the art department, and then we had to go through the engineering design, and it had to be compatible with the with studio requirements and so forth and so on. So that is in that book. Yeah, well, I mean, they, 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 they were six in gravity of the moon, but they, they were used to walking, and they tried to keep their same paces. And we talked about that. I mean, if they took a jump, they could have jumped quite far. But in our scene, we would want to have them walking down, and they walk sort of normally down the ramp to see that the TMA, the, the big monument. Oh, well, let me ask the audience. Uh, uh, Arthur Clark, I have a question for the audience. Arthur Clark had written nice little bit of narration in that early uh, uh, section on the dawn of man uh, explaining what the uh, monument had done and a lot of people that i talked to didn't really fully understand what that was a monument so but then those monkeys that were fighting amongst themselves because there's a lack of food and, and they were probably edging towards salvation uh, the super civilization that had come to, to earth as well as the moon put that monument up, and that would teach them to become predators. So when they got the bones, or they started killing, you know, warthogs and so forth. But it, the Kubrick, I thought the memories that Claude had put in, uh, just would have helped a quite a bit. But uh, Kubrick said, no, yeah, Kubrick's a boss. <laughs> Technology. That's before we actually, the PowerPoint was underway, but it was uh, uh, the, uh, it could be, but Carver, Cooper wanted to have called the film 2001 Space Odyssey. He wanted to look 35 years in the future. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that, what we were doing down at the Marshall Center, and I was also involved with this. But we did have a program going, uh, which was called Empire. 
early manned planetary and the planetary round trip expeditions, which would have been a manned mission launched from the Earth to go around the circuit of uh, 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 Mars and come back to Earth. And we thought that could happen probably in the mid 80s. But uh, the, uh, that was based on, 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 on nuclear technology that the Atomic Energy Commission was developed called the NERVA energy. NERVA, they all have to mean something. A nuclear energy for research vehicle application. And they were doing very well. So we had a plan to take our Saturn V rockets, put them into orbit, carry those nuclear rockets into orbit, strap them up with a nuclear, with a Mars mission module, and send them to the moon. And we thought it might be up to the Mars, that that might be feasible in the 1985 to 87 time period. And so I said to myself, well, if we could go around Mars, and there, and there was obviously a huge budget, uh, <coughs> that might be feasible. Well, Congress took the Saturn V out of production in 1972. Congress uh, uh, monetarily canceled the NERVA program in that same year. And uh, so we were all doing studies to return to the moon. They were all canceled. And uh, 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 the document that we produced called the post Apollo Space Program uh, only yielded the space shuttle. So all returning to the moon and going to Mars were canceled. Because the story was based 
1951 story that came out of Ten Stories Fantasy magazine called The Sentinel of Eternity, and that was discovered on the moon. And that, and that, that particular story uh, attracted uh, Cooper, and Cooper wanted to build the film around that story. But that, 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 that the Sentinel on the moon, they were short, they just sent them on the book city, both collected the short stories. And uh, that was supposed to be a message that we would discover that Sentinel would be up to the moon and uh, understand that there were superior beings somewhere that had been on the moon. That was the message. Uh, but it was, it, it, it was completely a fantasy ending to it, so you could use your imagination. Thank you so much, Fred Orman.